A compilation of major reports shows over 400 Nigerians were killed in the first three weeks of 2022. And the newly amended Electoral Act bill bars voters from contesting candidate certificates in court. This is Plus Politics. I am Justin Akadone. At least 486 people were killed in the first three weeks of 2022 by non-state actors across Nigeria. An average of 22 people a day, a compilation of major reports shows. Now, over 80% of the killings were carried out by terror groups that have terrorized the northern region. In the first week of the year, at least 216 people were killed by armed persons. The victims include the 200 killed in Zamfara, the 7 killed in Kaduna, 3 in Plateau, 3 in Akwaibom, and 3 in Ondo State. In the second week, at least 37 people were killed by non-state actors. The figures include 18 in Plateau, 1 in Abuja, 1 in Imo, and 17 in Kebi State. Now, in the third week, at least 13 people were killed, 3 persons in Kaduna, 4 in Abuja, 1 in Akwaibom, and 5 in Niger State. Now, last week, the Niger State Governor, Sunny Bello, announced that at least 220 people were killed in his state between January 1 and 17. Well, joining us to discuss this is Kabir, uh, the more security risk management expert and if they want now, a security analyst. Uh, let's start with Kabir. Good evening to you, Kabir. Many thanks for joining us on Plus Politics. Good evening, Justin. It's my pleasure to be here. All right, Kabir, let's just dive into this particular uh, worrying issue. From what we hear, about 486 people have been killed so far in just about um, 22 days, in three weeks, you know, in 2022. What does this really tell us? Because it is really uh, sudden if you consider that's about um, an average of, um, you know, uh, 80 uh, or 42 or 22 people, you know, daily. What does this really tell us about the security situation, judging by the fact that the uh, the president came out uh, sometime earlier this year, on January 1, and was telling us that uh, security is a bit under control in the country. Um, unfortunately, the reality says otherwise. It says that um, the situation is not exactly under control. Um, if where you have this number of persons being killed, then clearly social order the social contract that has brought us together as a people is no longer tenable as, as it should be. Um, even if it were, you know, 10 persons that were being killed in a month in Nigeria, then um, it, it's still worrisome. But it, in this instance, we're talking of hundreds, 400. Um, I do have my reservations regarding the sources used by this particular report. Um, I run a consultancy and we keep uh, our own data of death, and I know that in 2021, the list that we recorded for Edmond was around the same 400. In fact, in June of last year, we recorded 1,032 deaths just in, in that month alone. Um, now, I don't know what uh, methods this particular compiler of this data used, but I can tell you that um, the figure is almost similar to what we are also keeping using, you know, industry standard um, and scientifically verified methods. Um, now, there are certain things or common elements that run across all the locations where this death is being recorded. And that is the issue of non-state actors that have armed themselves and that are now challenging the supremacy of the um, use of force by the state, and unfortunately are successfully challenging that supremacy. So if you go to the Northeast, you have um, terrorist groups. If you go to the Northwest and North Central, you have bandits or terrorist groups, depending on what you want to call them. And then if you go to the Southeast and to an extent South-South, 
you have secessionist groups that have been um, challenging the authority of the state, as well as militants and sometimes some um, uh, you know, gunmen who are criminally oriented. So that, that's the common feature really across almost all parts of the federation. And it speaks at one thing, which is the weakness of the state institutions. First off, to protect um, citizens and residents. And then secondly, to ensure that these non-state actors who are challenging the supremacy of the state are arrested and you know penalized. Unfortunately, we were not seeing enough of that. So more of these non-state actors are Grew, uh, arriving and becoming bolder to, to do that. And that is why we're, we're seeing the situation. Um, there are triggers for these issues. One of the triggers is politics. And as you probably are aware, the political season has, has commenced. Um, there is a lot of um, political issues that are driving at attention at the moment. The AKT and Ocean State elections are being discussed. Um, the National Convention of the Ruling Party is an issue. Uh, the main opposition party, the People's Democratic Party, is right. also discussing most intensively. It's likely it's like there, and this is also a, uh, increasing the tension as well as the potential for violence as well as the death. All One right. issue that remains to be researched is the rise in ritual killings. Um, my consultancy, the database that we keep, has yeah. seen that rise in ritual killings where they are vesting body organs. And a lot of the anecdotal information suggests that that rise is associated with the politics that I, I, I discussed earlier. So that's where this 486 um, All right. people keep coming from. Okay, fine. We'll, we'll get back to it. We'll try and analyze, uh, you know, uh, the the figures and statistics that um, you know have been reeled out to us. Uh, from what we hear, about eighty percent of the killings were carried out by terror groups that have terrorized northwest and north central zones of Nigeria. In a minute, we'll come back to you, uh, Kabir. But let's bring up um, security analyst Ife Wanago into uh, this particular, you know, discuss. Uh, good evening, to you, Ife. Thanks for joining us on Plus Politics. Good evening. Um, always a pleasure to be here. Yes. If it, these figures are really very worrisome, it's just been uh, three weeks in 2022, and we hear that um, over 486 uh, you know, people have been killed. The ones that we know so far, some of them have not actually been reported. But more worrisome is that uh, these uh, you know, acts were carried out by non-state uh, actors. And Kirby just uh, gave us a bit of an um, overview, and he said that um, these uh, uh, terrorists, uh, these criminals, are uh, becoming uh, bolder by the minutes. What have we failed to see as it is uh, in uh, stemming this issue of security in Nigeria? Oh, okay. If I want to thank your last question correctly, um, what you expect us to do to stem the tide? What have we failed to see? You know, these non actors are becoming bolder by the day. Oh, okay. Okay, not much clearer. Uh, uh, for me, I, I'm very worried. Even before this report came out, the last time I saw the governor of Niger State pay a visit to the president in Asa Rock, you would see that a man who is clearly helpless, you know, and uh, it was clear, it, was, it is an open secret that part of Niger State, just like the other part of Bono State, are under the control of non state actors. In other words, there is an absence of governance authority as far as the Nigeria case is concerned. And in terms of what we have failed to see or what we've done, for me, there is no end game in sight and there is no concerted tactical approach to saying that this is how we want to go about this. It appears that terrorism and the like have been accepted as a norm now. We must now continue as a branch of Nigerian security and, and, and anti-terrorism network there must be now and again a continuous fight which is not fully coordinated and tailored towards a definitive end. So we have a situation where you make one inroad today, you step back, you make another inroad tomorrow, and you also allow the terrorists, the criminals, the aggressors, it holds way, and then you wait for a while, you go again. So as far as I'm concerned, what I find missing is the apparent lack of a coordinated approach with regard to having sufficient manpower, sufficient equipment, and strategy which they fail into field tactics on the ground. Within the one to the seven, what do we aim to achieve with X manpower deploying from X regions? As it stands, it appears like our military, our security agencies have said that certain parts of the country cannot be effectively secured. That is the impression that I have being from the security environment. So I wonder what 
the other Nigerian in Niger State and elsewhere would kill. You know, we can we can just oppose this with the issue that happened in Taraba the other day when we also have people from Cameroon coming in, the Ambazonians, mm. whatever you call them, coming to attack Nigerians and go away and there's nothing from the Nigerian perspective. So whereas we have internal issues we are dealing with, we have terrorists that have also turned upon us and we also have those ones that are climate induced in terms of the Sahel region and the third, um, third angle, the, the issues of um, climate change affecting them. So for me, it is missing on the part of the government that they have a strategy and a tactic to deliver this. Some All right. are missed. They need to really step up and the citizens need to know what the plan is and what is the end game. Is this going to be the case continuously until this government, uh, the, the tenure of this government is off and then the next one will come and continue? What is the end game? It is missing. All right, um, thank you, Efe, for your uh, input. Uh, let's bring back um, Kabir into this uh, discussion. I'm sure you have heard, uh, you know, Efe's um, point of view. He seemed to uh, note um, the issue of a um, lack of coordinated approach, uh, issues of manpower and equipment. But specifically, he was uh, emphatic when it came to uh, Niger State. Let's talk about that for uh, for just one uh, minute. Uh, you know, the governor, you know, said uh, at least 220 uh, 220 people were killed in his state between. January 1 and uh, 17, although most of the killings in the state were unreported until the governor's um, statement, meaning that the media could have missed out on the exact um, figure. What is happening in Niger State? Is it that uh, uh, the state itself or the government in Niger cannot is a bit overwhelmed as it cannot really secure you know, the lives and the property of um, residents uh, who reside there? Kabir. I'd like to categorically state that the industry standard practices that we use in collating the figures does not indicate that 220 people were killed in okay. Niger. Uh, What's the, the true figure, picture? The figure we have is much less than that. Um, it's about 78 persons. Um, so even, you know, the governor being the chief executive and the chief security officer in the state, one, one cannot dispute him. Um, what would have been really helpful when he stated that was to have indicated where these persons were killed. Because frankly, the, the, the processes that we use to collect our information includes the security agencies. And I can tell you with all sense of um, responsibility that even with the security agencies, the figures do not match what the governor mentioned. Um, again, because I'm quite experienced in the sector, uh, sometimes there could be errors in when the statements are being made. And I, I'm just hoping that that's not what happened in this instance. But then, um, even if the figure is the 78 that I mentioned, it's very worrisome and concerning. There are about five local governments that have been more or less dominated by these non-state actors. And one of the major worries for me is our inability as a people to even disaggregate the name of these non-state actors. So I prefer to call them gunmen because on the one hand, they are terrorists, just like the federal government has recently declared them. But then on the other hand, they are unknown gunmen. Uh, depending on which security agency you, you discuss with. Then again, depending on what uh, arm of the media you are in, engaging with, they could be called, uh, again, unknown gunmen, or even gunmen unknown, if you want to be funny. So that is a major issue. Who are we dealing with? And what crime are they committing? Is it a terrorist offense, or is it a criminal offense? Is it banditry? If it's bandit banditry, how come in the 21st century, in the year 2022, we have bandits that have dominated five local governments. These are outlaws. So how can you have outlaws in a state uh, that is governed and that has um, state institutions? Um, now, what are the common features that allow them to flourish in a state like Niger in these five local governments that I mentioned? Number one is landmass. Um, Niger has probably the biggest landmass in any of the states in the Federation at the moment. Um, number two is the un ungoverned spaces, the forested parts. Because of this large expanse of land, um, Niger, unfortunately, is disposed to, to that. Uh, several forested parts, several mountainous parts, 
that allow these non-state actors to hibernate. Number three is its proximity to crisis-prone areas such as Kaduna. And then, of course, through the ungoverned spaces that I mentioned, there is a direct sort of link through forests that traverses Zamfara, Kasena, um, Kaduna in, into Niger State. And then to an extent, even Plateau State. Uh, so a lot of the movement of these non-state actors uh, from this location, crisis prone location that I mentioned, ends up in Niger. Uh, so if there is an ongoing security force operation, like there is at the moment in the other locations like Amfara, Kasena, what they do is they move down. Uh, of course, there is pressure on them in Kaduna. They now move down into Niger, into these ungoverned spaces. Now, it's, very, it's also very easy for one to conclude that the state government has not been able to respond adequately. Now, the argument by the state government is that um, security still remains in the federal, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, exclusive list as well of the constitution. So the state, the state governors cannot do a lot uh, to, as, to, to address the issue because they, they can't control or dictate to this. So what do you suggest? Um, a, a combination, a, um, better coordination, just like FA has mentioned, between the federal and state government, and then a judicious use of the security vote, uh, apart from Lagos State, and perhaps, um, in fact, apart from Lagos State, I'm not aware that any other state has been transparent with the way it's using um, its, its security vote. What we hear is that they foil, uh, they provide funding for foil, foil for by these security agents, or sometimes they buy vehicles for them, but no other state government is transparent in terms of how it does that. Now, what Lagos State has done is to, um, it, it has this um, security trust fund, which is a pool through which every individual in the state, every corporate body in the state is able to put money, and then that money is transparently used to support security organization. Now, that is the kind of ingenious and um, you know practical steps I would like to see in states like Nigeria. So why are other states not with? actually uh, borrowing a leave from Lagos State? Um, because it's, it's easy money. It's money that is not audited, and so they are able to use it for things that, unfortunately, I don't even want to speak uh, about in this platform. Uh, they, this has been well documented. Um, CIVLAC did a report, I remember well about two years ago, that documented uh, this issue of security vote and how um, state governments, unfortunately, and not just state governments, um, it cuts across both state government, federal parastatals, name them. Uh, this is unaudited money that they use it for. So again, um, it's easy for the governor to mention this figure, but what is more important is he should have told us, for instance, where uh, right. this figure came from, and then what he is doing you know, to, to ensure that, uh, you know, by February, this figure reduces to, let's say, less than 10, and then we'll be happy. All right. Thank you, Kabir. We'll come back to you. Now, Efe, I'm sure you have been following the discussion. Let's talk about um, another state that gives me a bit of um, concern. Sometime in December, you know, on a daily basis, we were hearing of, uh, we could hear, or we heard rather, of um, killings along um, the Abuja, you know, Kaduna Expressway. From the reports that, uh, you know, was released from the compilation, you know, uh, the, uh, the West Seven killed uh, in the first uh, in the first three weeks uh, here in um, 2022. Three in Plateau, three in Aquaibom, and three in Undo State. Would you say, since uh, you know the declaration of um, bandits as um, terrorists, that um, the situation in that particular axis, that's um, Kaduna Abuja, has actually you know uh, changed for the better? If it well, I, I would not I would not be making the mistake of um. Um, making a hasty conclusion with regard to what the actual situation is. Because for me, and from the perspective I see, sometimes the, some of these things are not reported. Uh, as you are aware, the issues in Niger State were not in the public domain until the governor cried out. Um, so what was happening in Abuja Kaduna Rao uh, is, is sometimes you have a debt of reportage as to what is going on. But even then, if we have some respite for a week, two weeks, or a month in a particular argument, and then Sokoto and Kaduna Inland and Zafara become issues, and by the time you think you're having some respite there, Nanda is up and Borno is up. You remember what happened when the president visited Borno State and there was a rocket fire into, into Maduguri from outside, and we described it as people who are fleeing or who are being defeated and what have you. So, for me, I, I wouldn't say that the declaration of uh, this bandit being a terrorist 
has uh, achieved results for us. There is still more to be seen and um, to be done. And as far as I'm concerned, we need to have a, a, a proper coordination nationally. And let us not forget to mention that a few days or a few weeks ago, it was reported that the police is complaining that Nigerians are not turning up for recruitment. And the first uh, public relations officer specifically mentioned Southern Nigeria. South, South, South East. People are not coming up to be recruited into the police. Mm. I do not know what the army is seeing with regard to recruitment of first people. I'm talking about Niger State, digressing a little. You are aware that it has about 10% of the land mass of the entire country. Yes, it does. What have we done to scale up the number of security agents in the country? Military, police, paramilitary. So it, for me, it appears like we, are not, we don't have the urgency. We have a war situation and call it um, a staccato of sorts. You know, it is not uh, normal warfare. It is not synthetic warfare. So what, what you have here is different. It's a guerrilla kind of thing. And it's not a single group. So the country is being torn as it seems by different forces. We are supposed to be in war mode. So in terms of manpower, training, personnel, there's supposed to be an aggressive recruitment. And in some cases, without um, being immodest, you can see you would even conscribe. There should be conscription going on to have the requisite numbers and tie that into the, the weaponry that you have and you deploy appropriately, then you can hold commanders to account. So I think that the, the, the paucity of information as to what goes on in the Kaduna, Abuja Kaduna Act just now, is not enough for us to say that yes, because we were declared as terrorists, there is now some... Okay, see what happens with the crisis we now have um, from, from Kanu, from the little five-year-old girl that was kidnapped. So it's not a franchise. Boko Haram is now a franchise. The, the banditry is not a franchise. Everybody is cashing in on criminality across the country. We are, we are aware that even in southwest Nigeria, some criminals will go kill people and they will pretend and they will um, have a decoy and, and look like they are some full and inherent men. Meanwhile, they are from the southwest itself. And the same scenario across both. So I think that the government may be overwhelmed. If they need to seek foreign support, they should seek foreign support. All right, they if say. they need to break down the shoulders and the head of the military commanders, they should do the same. I'm also aware that the military has been asking that they need more equipment, they need more personnel. The police, the same thing. What about the DSS, the intelligence angle? What are they providing? What, what are they bringing to the table? Are you supporting them to deliver? Are you giving them the requisite manpower that they need? So I think the, the, the NSA must be talking more to the president. He must be the one declaring the house of the Air Force we have at all these issues of insecurity. And there must be an end game. I like to repeat, you don't fight an indefinite war and expect that things will just fall in place. You don't have an approach that is basically a no approach. What is your aim? You are aware, for instance, that parts of Kaduna, parts of um, Niger State, parts of Bonu State are under siege. So what are you doing? When we have election in Anambra, you were able to deploy over 30,000 policemen. So what are you doing in such places? Why are you not mopping up people, getting friendly forces, and target particular areas at the same time? Right. Because when you face only Niger State, you have some red fights, and then they are up in Kaduna, or they are up in Zampara, or maybe they go to Kwara. So for me, the government needs to break down the shoulders of its commanders. All right, thank and you. Beyond Ethan. doing that, you must support them aggressively. All right. Thank you. Let's just get some final words from um, Kabir Adamo as we wrap up on this particular discourse. Uh, you know, if you raise some uh, pertinent, uh, you know, uh, point, you talked about, uh, you know, the recruitment of, uh, you know, Nigerian police, uh, the Salvadors are not actually showing any interest. He also talked about um, ungoverned um, territories uh, in the, um, maybe some part of the northern uh, uh, you know, states in Nigeria. As we wrap up this discussion now, so what should be, you know, what should the government, uh, that's the federal and the state's government, be doing in the interim so that, uh, you know, the residents can actually go to bed with both of your eyes, you know, closed? So, um, I mean, co better coordination um, is the way to go. Each of these government levels have their own security arrangements. 
So at the federal level, you've got like 27 ministries, departments, and agencies. And um, FA has talked about the need for coordination between these 27 ministry departments and agencies, as well as the military um, units. Um, but beyond this better coordination um, at the federal level, I believe there is need for enhanced coordination between the federal and state levels. Um, there is no state uh, government, that, no state that you go to in Nigeria today that does not have some form of state level arrangement. In fact, in some states, you have different state level arrangements. I can use the example of Zamfara State um, that has the Ansekai, uh, which created the monster that we have today in terms of banditry. If you go to Borno State, they have different they have civilian JTF, they have hunters. You know, you need name them. They are all state level units, and the reason why I'm saying this is because they are documented and they are being paid some form of stipends by the state government, but they are not captured into the security architecture. So we need better coordination between the federal and state government so that all these state level arrangements are captured into the security architecture. Now, this is for the short term. For the long term, I, I think we need to start having a conversation around decentralization of right. security arrangement at the country so that we can have some form of state level um, either policy or security arrangement that is recognized by the constitution not this um, haphazard approach that we have that frankly is not helping us it's actually causing more than helping us all right, thank you so much. Indeed, uh, we need to you know, be more coordinated in our approach to fighting you know, the issues of um, security, you know, stemming these um, issues in the board. Many thanks to um, Efe Wanaro, uh, security analyst, and of course, Kabir Mohammed, uh, security risk management expert. Uh, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen. You're welcome, Justin. Thank you for having us. All right. All right, thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now, and when we return, Nigerian voters might be stopped from challenging the certificate of candidate of elections, except they participated in the primaries. More in a moment. Stay with us.